worthy. Why don't you stand to your feet one more time, lift your voice, raise your faith. Hallelujah. Let there be an atmospheric flow right now of the Holy Ghost. Jesus, we love you. We appreciate you, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Oh, how wonderful is your name. How excellent is your name in all of the earth. Somebody shout amen. Somebody shout amen. Somebody shout amen. Amen. Isn't God good? All the time, God is good. I know I probably said it the last time I was here, back in the latter part of October, but I would like to say it again. He's been better to me than I've been to myself. Because we love us. We do. We spend thousands of dollars a year feeding our appetites on whatever it may be. And so why not come into the presence of the Lord? The Bible says, if ye being evil know to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts unto you? Amen. I'm thankful for the things that he has given me. I would like to turn your attention to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter 1. Then uh, we will read verse number 21 through verse number 25. And then we will read Matthew 27 through uh, with one verse of Scripture, verse 17. Matthew chapter 1. As you're turning in your Bibles, I give great honor to your wonderful pastor, his awesome family. Thank you, Brother Scott, for allowing me to be back. Don't you love your pastor? Isn't he a great shepherd? Amen. Amen. I appreciate him so much. Yes, I am I am thrilled to be back in the house of the Lord with, uh, with you all. And... Uh, look forward to what the Lord has for the remainder of the service, and I know that we have worshipped, we have put forth so much effort to praise His name, and so if you don't mind, can I just go with your theme for tonight? And you'll, you'll catch on as I begin to read this scripture here, but, but I want to follow the theme and the flow of the Holy Ghost tonight and remind you that, as your pastor said, we, we are not operating in the normal. If you are a guest, if you are a visitor, it's so very nice to meet you. Uh, I am a guest here tonight as well, a guest speaker. And uh, I will tell you that we do not operate in the normal. We do not operate within the natural. But when you come into the presence of the Lord, you operate in the supernatural. For there is a supernatural flow of the presence of the Lord that overtakes the atmosphere. We ought to have a right response to the atmosphere of God. Amen. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 21 reads like this. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Verse 22. Now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of, by the Lord, uh, spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Verse 24. Then Joseph being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, verse 25, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called, and he called his name Jesus. I would like to take you real quick to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 with one verse of Scripture concluding our text, Matthew 27 and verse number 17. The Bible says, Therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Who will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? I would like to preach along the themes of Jesus' name this evening and and, and, and bring to you a little bit of, uh, if I may, some meat. I'm going to eat some meat tonight through the Word. And, and, and I want to bring uh, this simple message to you, a, a simple thought. The man on the other side of Pilate. The man on the other side of Pilate. Would you put your Bibles down, throw your hands in the air, and thank God for His infallible Word. Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for this Word that will last forever. Hallelujah. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but this word shall not pass. 
This word is a lamp to my feet and light to my path. This word shall I hide in my heart that I may not sin against you. This word, O God, let it forever be in front of me. The Bible says the frontlets of mine eyes. Let it forever be written in my heart. Let it forever be the leading of my hand and the guiding of my life, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Somebody clap your hands and give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. If you're going to help me preach, you can be seated. We live in a time and in a place of a mighty mixture of messages concerning the identity and purpose of God through Jesus Christ. It has become a Christian culture of convenience that presents the mighty God made to order or even have it your way. This, of course, has had the effect that it has become very difficult to discover the great deliverer due to the deluded messages that are among us. But my friends, uh, I wish to inform you that this is not a new problem. Ancient enemies of truth have long understood that the easiest route to resist revelation is to inundate the seekers with selections and choices. This reality has been proven as Sheena Yanger stated uh, that too many choices can overwhelm us and cause us to not choose at all. She says, for businesses, this means that if they offer too many choices, nothing is bought. Thomas Brown declared that when people have too many choices, they make bad choices. Barry Swartz has written and spoken on the reality of this in his book, The Paradox of Choice, as he says, more is less and then this can all lead to something called decision paralysis. But I wish to take your minds to the book of Joshua, chapter 24 and verse 15, as this leader of Israel stands on the precipice on some kind of uplifting, and he looks out across the tribes of Israel, and he begins to speak to them in the pastoral authority that he had. He says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. He goes on and goes on with this, but he makes a statement at the end of it all, and I know it's right there on the screen, but I want you to imagine in your mind as this man of God stands there and looks out the, uh, across the crowd of the children of Israel. He probably straightens up his tie, buttons his coat. He gets his himself all ready to make this one grand statement as he looks them in the eye as I'm looking you in the eye tonight and he says but as for me and my house he, he says I understand I, you have to make a choice you have to make a choice of who God you want to serve what God you want to serve the God of the Amorites or the God of the people in whose land ye dwell right now you have a choice to make he says he says and informs them that he already already made his decision that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That as for me and my family, that as for me and my sons, that as for me and my daughters, that mom and dad, you need to take authority in your home. Mom and dad, you need to take authority in the bedrooms of your home. You need to take authority within the privacy of your children's lives and let them know as, as for me and as for you. Mama, your prayers don't need to die just because a little rebellion runs through your baby's mind. Uh, mama, your prayers don't need to quit uh, and cease just because uh, you had a bad argument with your baby, uh, just because you had a bad disagreement with your baby. I want to tell some children in here, uh, you need to listen to mom and dad uh, when they make the bold statement for their household. Uh, as for me uh, and my house, uh, we will serve the Lord. 
we will serve the Lord. I understand the day and hour of which we live. I'm in youth ministry. I'm the district youth secretary for the, uh, the district of Texas. I understand the bad decisions that we see young people are making, rioting in the streets, vandalism, fear, hatred, hate crimes, hurting, oh, disappointments, backstabbing, all of these things going on within the generation of which is living in their youth of today. I understand that they're making bad decisions every time they turn around. But how about you take it from me, a young man who while he was in Bible college, he hyped himself up on performance enhancement supplements. He hyped himself up on everything that he could so that he could one day stand on a stage and make a name for himself and build up his own glory. How about you take it from me, a young man who while was training within the same Jim, uh, that he was purchasing his supplements in. Uh, coaches would come up to him uh, and say, why don't you walk on to San Joaquin County College? Uh, why don't you walk on to Delta College? Uh, you can be a great athlete. You can go to the NFL. You can be a great free safety. You can be a great running back. Uh, and I'm so thankful I made a decision one day uh, and I told him uh, that as for me, uh, for God I live uh, and for God I decide to die. Uh, I have made my decision. I have kept my faith and I will not be pulled away from the line that I've drawn in the sand and stepped across. I want to tell some people in this house right now, it's time for a decision to well up within you. As for me and as for my house, we are going to serve the Lord. about man that God has always known about. That men have a desire to worship, but then man seemingly can't make up his mind to step in his direction. So men have created a plethora of pagan deities that have filled the earth since ancient times. God gifted men with the ability to choose, yes. But then God in turn makes it abundantly clear to us that there is not a multiple choice selection to save us. It is literally His way, or it is the highway. He does not share His glory with any other. He does not share His throne with any other. He does not share His power with any other. He does not share His might with any other. He's the sovereign God of heaven, and He presents Himself tonight to mankind, and He declares unto the people sitting on these pews, Choose me, seek after me, follow after me, come searching for me. And He said, and if you do, do if you will I can make your world and your life make sense you can't get through this life on your own, sir. You can't get through this life on your own, ma'am. Oh, you can try, but I'll tell you, sin will take you further than you're willing to travel and cost you more than you're willing to pay. And after the billboards have been painted uh, to picture the beautiful, to picture the handsome, to picture the fun uh, and all of the pleasure of sin, let me remind you, it's only for a season, but you will reap uh, the heartache uh, of the consequences for a lifetime. I wish to remind somebody in here, sin is not your friend. The world will never show you a veteran. They will only show you a rookie. They will only show you the individual before the breakdown. They will only show you the individual before the addiction. They will only show, they refuse to show you uh, the picture of the mutilated minds uh, and the devastated lifestyles. They refuse to show you, but God says, I can show you a greater life, uh, a life of abundance. I can show you another way, for I am the truth, the way, and the life. Oh, God, son, he came into the house tonight, and he says, if you will seek after me, I will make your world make sense. And the key to cutting through the barter of the lesser gods to discover the one true God is we have to get back to the word of God. We have to be a word of God people. 
we have to be a word of God saint. We have to be a word of God person. I wish to remind you, I may have said this the last time I was here, the difference between me and anybody else outside those doors. I'm not better than anybody, absolutely not. He said, I've got a rock that can replace you in a heartbeat. The rocks will cry out in your place. So I'm just about as good as a rock. Okay, that's fine. But I'll tell you why I'm different. I'll tell you why you're different. I'll tell you why we are different. Our uniqueness is not found in any business. Our uniqueness is found in our response to the word of truth that we preach. So we have to be a word of God people. Because our uniqueness is found in the response to the word of God that is preached across this pulpit. And our uniqueness is found in the change that the word of God brings to your life. That's where we're unique. That's where we have to be different. That's where we have to be changed. And so we have to get back into the word. I wish to remind you that time spent with the word is time spent with God. You want to know how I know that? I'll just tell you. John chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him, not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. But if you skip down to verse number 14, and you begin to read a little bit further, it simply says, And the Word was made flesh, and it dwelt among us, and we beheld this thing called His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We've got to be a word people, because if we are a word people, we are a God people. If we are a word people, then we are a sovereign God people. And if we are a word people, if you begin to reflect the word, you're telling me you, you are a direct reflection of the one who wrote it. If you are one who would reflect the word of God, then you're telling me you are a direct reflection of the God who said, I am the word. So we have to get back to the word. Ephesians 1 and 21, whenever we begin to read about this individual called Jesus, it says, For above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he's put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that fulfilleth all in all. Can I go off just a little bit on this? name called Jesus. There is a name that's above every name. The name of Jesus Christ. Jesus in Hebrew means God saves. Christ in the Greek translation of the Hebrew means Messiah, the anointed one. The name Jesus means Jehovah's my salvation. Jehovah the Savior. The name Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Yeshua, meaning the Lord is my salvation. But we need to understand But we need to understand that at the moment that God gave Joseph and Mary the name to name this baby that they would give birth to, that that name would not have been strange nor unusual in the land of Israel. When the angel uttered the name to Mary and Joseph, it wasn't the first time that they had heard this particular name. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Son of the living God. Yes, that was new. We see the name Jesus used in in many other scriptures concerning other people. In Colossians chapter 4, it talks about Jesus whose name was called Justice. That name would not have been unusual to hear. Therefore, Jesus, seeing into our day, He notified this. He notified us ahead of time that we must grasp literally which Jesus we want. For the Bible says in Matthew 24 and 5, Many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets who shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And so he says, for all of humanity to hear, just simply tell me, which Jesus do you want? Now I'd like to get to my text. It was the custom for the governor to release a prisoner to the people at the feast of Passover. 
And as heaven would have it orchestrated, there came this moment when Pilate stood before the people of Jerusalem and he offered them a simple choice. The multitude, the mob, together with the elders of Israel who had been summoned from their meeting in the temple, they were gathered at the doors of the praetorium. When Pilate came and he spoke to them and he presented to the people that day a choice in one incredibly heavenly orchestrated moment, we have a picture presented to all of humanity. Barabbas representing the first Adam, standing on the platform of the world with the second Adam known as Jesus Christ. Between them, a man cries out to all of us for all of time. Which one do you want? In this episode, playing out with these two Jewish radicals, risking it all for very different reasons, we see the man Barabbas and we see the man called Jesus. Therefore, tonight, I come to you as a salesman presenting two different kinds of presentations. I wish to present to you a choice. May I present to you first this man called Barabbas. There could not have been a better man who personified, who pictured, who illustrated the worldly, fleshly serving man. A man who was a picture of the first Adam after the fall in the garden. Barabbas is his name. A Jewish terrorist in the custody of the Roman police uh, there in Jerusalem. He was arrested and tried for revolt, insurrection, sedition, and treachery. Barabbas was a wicked individual. The man standing in contrast to the Christ uh, was a murderer, a rebel, and a deceiver. And when it came time to choose uh, between a vile robber and a blessed redeemer, common sense would surely tell us uh, that it would guide the choice correctly. Uh, We would suppose From his name to his lifestyle that he lived, Barabbas was a fleshly serving man. Please allow me to show you how other biblical translations interpret Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 17. In the New English translation, it says, So after they had assembled, Pilate said unto them, Who do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus called the Christ? In the NIV, in the New International Version, it says, Which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus called the Messiah? You see, when you begin to look this up and study, many textual scholars believe that Jesus Barabbas, that name was the original reading in the original text, but it was taken out later in reverence and respect to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But consider with me of the criminal standing next to God, what his name means. As we know, Barabbas, Bar in scripture always means the son of Barabbas, literally means the son of Abbas. Abbas in Greek literally means father. Therefore, Barabbas, that name means son of the father. So Pilate standing on the platform that day without realizing it asked the crowd by proxy the world, which Jesus do you want? Do you want Jesus Barabbas or do you want Jesus the Christ? Barabbas' name literally means when you put it together in the Greek, son of the fleshly father son of the earthly father. So he asked them that day, who do you want? Do you want Jesus, the son of the flesh, the son of failures and temptations? Do you want Jesus Barabbas, the son of anger, pain, distress, lies and deceit? Do you want Jesus Barabbas, the son of unrighteousness? Do you want the son of unholiness? Or do you want this one over here called Jesus the Messiah? Jesus, the son of the Father, Jesus, the Son of God, the second Adam, God, Pilate that day gave them a choice, one Jesus for another. Who will rule you? He began to ask them. Do you want the first Adam or do you want the second Adam? And I come to us tonight declaring to many here under the sound of my voice that this decision is still before us. Even now, that day, they made the fateful decision to release the sinner and to crucify the Savior. That day they cried out, give life to carnality but bring death to the Christ. And so they begin to point out give us Barabbas. They begin to scream out give us the son of the father of flesh. Give us 
Jesus, the son of the flesh. Therefore, Pilate had to throw to them Jesus Barabbas, the murderer, the representation of death and taking life. But just on the other side of Pilate stood another man by the same name of Jesus. And where Barabbas was a representation of death and stealing life away, Jesus literally came that he may give life and give it more abundantly. As I presented to you, this man called Jesus Barabbas of the original text now as your salesman for the evening, may I please give a presentation about the man on the other side of Pilate. The man on the other side of Pilate standing in front of the mob that day. Who is he? Tell me about him. Give me a description of him. I'm so glad that you asked for me to give you a specific description of the man on the other side of Pilate. Because whenever I begin to think about him and I begin to put pen to paper and I begin to put words to a script, I just simply have to tell you who he is. He is the mighty one. He is the restorer. He is the one who sustains and he's the one who rescues. He is the king of kings and he is the lord of lords. He is my shield and my buckler and my exceeding great reward. He is a stronghold and he's my refuge. He is my strength and he's a lifter up of my head. He's the one who crowns me with love and kindness. He's the one who follows me all the days of my life with mercy that endures forever. He's a lamp to my feet and he's a light to my path. He's the one who girds me with gladness and turns all of my mourning into joy. When life has kicked you in the teeth and you fall into your knees and you feel like you're flat on your back, you're having to look up just to see dirt. I'll tell you, when you're down, you can still arise. And when you stumble, you can still stand strong. How can this happen? Because the man on the other side of Pilate, he fights for me and he fights for you. He's the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and he is the Prince of Peace. He's the shepherd and he's the high place. He's the one who daily loadeth me with benefits. He's the one who supplies all of my needs according to his riches and his glory. He's the giver of life. He's the light of the world. He's the bread of life. He's a bright and morning star. He's a lion and he's a lamb. He's a living bread. He's a lily of the valley. He's a rose of Sharon. He's a bridge over troubled water. Oh, he's a healing balm of guilt. Ed, can I tell you about the man on the other side of Pilate? That man on the other side of Pilate is still high and lifted up, and his train still fills the temple. Can I get deep for just a little bit? I've been just scratching surface level here. But he is a covering for me and you as we are a covering for him. The scripture talks about Lucifer, who, by the way, fell from heaven like lightning to the earth. But Lucifer says, uh, the Bible talks about Lucifer as being so shining as a star. As the Bible says that when the stars begin to sing. And so they look at him as being one of these bright stars. Why? Because Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covereth. And whenever he began to cover him, come here, son. He began to cover God, turn and face that way. And whenever he was the anointed cherub that covereth, that means that he took his wings and he would cover God just like this. From the backside, he never saw the front of God. If he would have seen the front of God, then he'd have known exactly who Jesus was. Because the Bible says... Jesus told them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That means 
means I look like him. He looks like me. But whenever he was in the wilderness, the old Lucifer came to him and said, Hey, if you really are the Son of God, cast yourself down. He was basically saying, I really don't know because I never saw God's face. I only saw him from behind. I only got to shadow him and cover him from behind. That is the reason that God told Moses, I'll show you my glory, Moses. Exodus chapter 33, go read it. He said, I'll show you my glory, but you can only see my hinder part because that's all I would show Lucifer. And whenever Lucifer saw it, he coveted my glory so much, he said, I will make myself like the Most High. I will exalt myself above him. And the Bible says that Lucifer tried to exalt himself even above the very most high. But the scripture tells us that he fell like lightning from heaven. Oh, somebody's got to hear me. And whenever we begin to praise, we literally restore the covering that was there. How do I know that? Because the Bible tells me in Psalms chapter 22 that he inhabits the praises of his people. Do you know what that means? That word inhabits. It means dwells in or covered under. Therefore, therefore I got to tell you when I praise, I get a little bit of the glory because I cover God with my worship. Oh. Some of y'all about to cut me off right now. Some of y'all watched the Super Bowl. I know you did. I was preaching the whole time. Did three services that day. Didn't watch none of it. But I happened to know what Lady Gaga did in her halftime show. You go ahead. Look the article up. She makes a confession of what she did. As she stood at the top, the very tip top of the stadium, the very, very tip top of the stadium, she said she only wanted to be equal to the stars. Nobody else above her in any kind of footage or elevation. And she stood up there on the very tip top of the stadium as that top dome had opened up. And she sang a specific song called, I'm on the edge of glory. Glory. And then she plummeted, she jumped, bungee cord all the way down to the surface of the field. Do you not understand? She made the confession. She reenacted what Lucifer had done. <laughs> but when I pray and I cover God and I get a little bit of the glory, I've got a message for all of you that love Lady Gaga. You're on the edge of glory, but whenever I praise, I live within the glory. When, oh, you may like it being on the edge, Lady Gaga. You may like it being on the edge of glory, but Lady Gaga, whenever I stand up in a service and I begin to call on the name of Jesus, Lady Gaga, whenever I stand in the presence of the Most High, lift my voice, throw my hands in the air, put movement into my action. I'll tell you, I covered God with my praise. Therefore, you're on the edge, but I live in the glory. You want some of the glory of God. You can't get it being on the edge of God. You can't be in it. You can't get it being on the outskirts of God. You want some of the glory of God. You've got to jump in with a loud praise that says, I am the covering. I am the restorer of the covering of God. Oh, I came to preach to you of how I chose the man on the other side of Pilate. And whenever I begin to praise, my praise begins to cover him. And I'll tell you, God is not satisfied, nor does he accept a casual praise. You want to know how I know that? Because God does not inhabit your praise as if it's a vacation visiting and leaving and a casual praise just says God 
I'm thankful to be in your presence. Hallelujah. But I really don't want to get worked up. I don't want to get worked up. Why? Because. Is praise really that important? Well, I'll tell you, if just going off of one stick, don't hit me on my candy stick of praise. I'll get a sugar rush going off on praise. But whenever he inhabits the praises, it literally means he lives there. He resides there. Therefore, God does not reside within just a casual little praise. He says, you're trying to take me on a vacation. I don't want a vacation to where I leave you after a week and I leave you after two weeks and I leave you after a momentary time. I'm not interested in a casual praise. I'm interested in inhabiting inhabiting the praise because when you come into the presence of the Lord, you bring a response of praise. Why? Because you chose the man on the the other side of Pilate. That man on the other side of Pilate, let me tell you who he is. Can I continue to describe to you the man on the other side of Pilate? When I begin to think about him and the reason that I praise him and the reason that I worship him, I put pen to paper and word to script and I begin to come up with things like he's the wisdom of Solomon and he's the strength of Samson. He's the devotion of Samuel. He's the love of John, the meekness of Moses. He's the patience of Job. He's the power of Peter. He's the holiness of Paul. He's the deliverer of Daniel. He's a fourth man in a fiery furnace. He's the angel of Israel. He's the boldness of Elijah. He's the humility of Stephen. He's a live coal that touched the lips of Isaiah. He's the bravery of Joshua, the obedience of Gideon. He's a stone in David's sling. I'll tell you when I'm hungry. He's the bread of life when I'm thirsty. He's a living water from a deep well. He's a covering for my destitute life. He's a path for my blindness. In physics, he defied the law of material and walked through walls and walked on water. In science, he defied the law of death and came back to life all by himself without help from any other. In mathematics, he has proved to us he is the power of one. For there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's one God and Father of all who's above all, through all, and in you all. Whenever I begin to think about the man that just simply stood on the other side of Pilate, I begin to think about all he's capable of doing and as scripture I begin to think about every place I can find and describe his skill and ability the scripture tells me he's omnipotent he has all power the Bible says he's omnipresent he's everywhere at one time the Bible tells me he's omniscient he knows all things that are to be known he tells me he's omnicompetent he's capable in all matters. He's omniferous, the speaker of all laws. He's omnific, the creator of all things. Without him, there was nothing made that was made. He said, I take on any form that I choose. I'm omnisufficient because I supply all of your needs according to my riches and my glory. He says, I'm all wise. I combine all attributes into one being. He says, I'm eternal. The man on the other side of Pilate. When I talk about his name, that man, Jesus, I talk about everything that he is. When I say his name, I talk about every name that he is. Therefore, can I tell you what Jesus is? Jesus is the one who put on humanity so that one day you and I might put on uh, divinity. The one who became the son of man so that we may become the sons of God. Jesus is the one who laid aside royalty to become a peasant. Jesus is the one who lived in poverty yet he owned a cattle on a thousand hills. Jesus is the one who was raised in obscurity yet he was the king of kings and the lord of all lords. Jesus is the one who had no worldly wealth, no affluence, no former education. 
yet more books are written about him. More people seek after him and his knowledge and his wisdom than any other being who ever lived in this world. And I'll tell you how he did it. Jesus as a baby, he startled the kings. And Jesus as a boy, he puzzled the doctors. And Jesus as an adult, he ruled the course of nature. I'm preaching about the man on the other side of Pilate. And I'm coming to a close. Coming to a close right now. If the music would come. Whenever I begin to think about Jesus and his Christ. They called him Jehovah. The one who was and is and is to come. They called him Elohim, the eternal one. They gave him titles. Like Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present. Jehovah Elion, the Lord my host. Jehovah Roha, the Lord my shepherd. And Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. He is the great physician. He is. He's a healer. Just take a moment right now and tell you. You've been faced with a death sentence. The doctor's given you a bad report. The doctor has showed you what is. But Jesus wants to come along and tell you what can be. As a healer. But you're a young man. What do you know about God being a healer? I've got an 11-month-old son right now most beautiful blue eyes you ever saw and curly blonde hair and my grandmother calls him the golden boy he's precious and he's wonderful but in 2014 the doctor looked at my beautiful little bride and said you'll never be able to have children I'm sorry you're going to have to take a high dose of fertility drugs just in order for you to be able to get pregnant and then we don't even know if he's going to if that baby can come out normal because of the high dosage of fertility drugs that you would have to take and I looked at her and I said you know what hon we're going to go home and I began to call on the man on the other side of Pilate I began to call on him and I put it in his hands and I said you know what God I want children I want my legacy to live on I want my spirit to live on within my children I want them to carry this gospel the way I've carried it I want them to preach this word the way I preach it I want them to be better disciples I want them to be greater saints I want them to be more powerful sons and daughters of you Lord and I begin to pray and I begin to pray and we got phone call after phone call to come minister hurting on the inside because we were told we would never have a legacy in our life. We were told we would never see children running behind us and hear those beautiful voices calling out to us saying mama and daddy. No little hands to hold to call ours. No little tears to wipe because only we can be superman and superwoman to our babies. You know what I'm talking about. We would go and we'd preach and oh I got a phone call to come preach a youth camp in Arkansas and so I said you know what that's fine we got ready we were a week out my wife came to me and said honey we gotta go to the doctor I just took this little thing called a test and it's telling me something that is in direct opposite of what the doctor said I tell you, I've got an 11 month old little boy and the only reason he is here today, the only reason that boy is alive and breathing today, the only reason he has life within his being is because I began to call on the man on the other side of Pilate. I was preaching a revival down in Dayseta, Texas. Oh, I'm just a country boy from a little podunk town. They call us rednecks out there. I don't know much. I'm not highly educated. But I do understand the power that is withheld within the name of Jesus. I understand the weight and authority that it carries. And I was just simply preaching Jesus and Him crucified. And that revival down there in Dayseta, Texas, a man by the name of Bubba Hart. We call him Bubba back in Texas. 
glasses. Bubba Hart, he stood up well-dressed, well-groomed, great man, great children, great family. I did not know that Bubba Hart was battling with severe diabetes, took all kinds of extra insulin a month, costing his wallet, costing his finances multiple and multiple dollars to take in that extra insulin. His wife had just fell a day before. She had calcium knots and pockets up on her elbow and her shoulder. She could barely move her right arm. Her hip was killing her. And I noticed she didn't get up and worship very much that day. But Bubba stood up and he got out of his pew and he stood about right here. And I began to preach about the man on the other side of Pilate. And just in passing, I laid my hand on his chest. And what I felt, Bubba began to shake and he began to quiver and he began to speak in tongues. And when he fell back and touched his wife, his wife took that bruised, took that hurtful arm and all of a sudden stuck it straight up in the air and began to worship. She got up out of her pew and began to dance and God healed Bubba Hart's wife right then and there because he decided, I'm going to praise the man on the other side of Pilate. And a week and a half later, here I go, back through day set of Texas, a little town of only about a thousand people. And Bubba Hart meets me at the church. I decided to come back and celebrate their pastor and his wife's 50th anniversary for their wedding. And so I decided I showed up and Bubba Hart met me at the door. He pulled out that monitor that had been telling him just how bad his blood was ravaged with diabetes and just how bad his blood was and the imbalances going on in his system. And he looked at me. He said, hey, you see this? These lines and these numbers are usually crazy. But whenever you prayed for me that day and I began to call on the he, he quoted it. He said, and I began to call on the man on the other side of Pilate. He said, I went to the doctor a week after that mer that morning service and he said that doctor looked at me and said no more extra insulin it just seems to me that your blood has decided to heal itself and I just happen to know you cannot get the blood of Jesus unless you go through the name of Jesus therefore he began to praise the man on the other side of Pilate and God has healed his body of diabetes Since that service, they, it has been their theme, the man on the other side, the pilot. Half a dozen people have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and all of them have been baptized in Jesus' name. Can I take you home for just a little bit? Can I take you home? I wasn't preaching. Yes, sir. I don't think I was. A lady came up and said, you know what? I have severe migraines. Another one came up and said, my daughter's got seizures. Another one came up and said, my daughter's about to get out of prison and her pimp has already called her in jail. All of them came up to the front. The one with the migraines, she lifted her hands, her eyes were already slit, her head was already down, and she literally said, I call on the man on the other side of Pilate. That man called Jesus. And she began to worship him. And we just found out the other day the doctor has released her of all medication because God has healed the mind. The little girl with the seizures, I began to pray with the mama. They were about right here. I began to pray with the mama and I just simply said the greatest thing in the world that you could ever tell God is simply when you lift your hands and worship you begin to say Jesus I love you she began to say Jesus I love you Jesus uh, tears began to flow down her face uh, her daughter standing next to her didn't know what to do uh, I began to pray for the daughter the mama began to worship the daughter stood there really don't know, not knowing what to do uh, or how to proceed in worship
worship, uh, but because of the mama calling on the name on the other, the man on the other side uh, of Pilate, uh, that daughter has not had another seizure since that night, and she's used uh, to having several a week uh, in a week's time. I'm here to tell you tonight, church, uh, you've got a need in your life, uh, you've got problem situation, you've got illness, you've got infirmity, you've got things facing you, uh, you've got roadblocks, you've got bridges in your path, uh, you've got so many gaps, uh, you've got barriers, uh, oh, you've got so many obstacles uh, that you're coming up against. Uh, I want to tell you, they are nothing when you begin to call on the man on the other side of Pilate. Uh, therefore, I open up this front right now to anybody that needs a healing. Why don't you release your faith in this atmosphere? Why don't you release your faith uh, in this house right now? I call on anybody uh, that needs a situation uh, taken care of right now, this very instant. Uh, if you need a healing in your body, uh, if you need obstacles taken out of your way, uh, if you need God to make a way uh, out of no way, why don't you lift your hands and release your faith uh, and say, God, heal me. God, take care of the predator. God, take care of the evil. God, take care of the situation. God, I release my faith uh, so that you can have control. Why don't you begin to call on the man on the other side of Pilate?